I've titled today's message, Dead Sinners into Living Saints. And while you turn there in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, let me quickly just mention a few things here. Now, in chapter 1, let me cover that. Paul discussed God's eternal plan in choosing those who are predestined to sonship and the fact that all believers on earth and in heaven will be brought together under Christ, the head of the church. Now, as we get now into the next couple of chapters, he's going to explain the execution of this eternal plan by showing how God makes sinners into saints and how he then places them into the church, Christ's body. Here, though, in the first 10 verses that we're going to be covering here of, in chapter 2, Paul will discuss how, by God's great power, he has spiritually regenerated sinners, transforming them from death to life, from dead sinners into living saints. Now, it's no accident that we find Paul writing these words immediately after his prayer. See, Paul, in order for this, these Ephesian Christians to understand the power behind that transformation, he first wanted them to understand God's power in Christ. A power that was manifested in the past at Jesus' resurrection and ascension. A power that will be manifested in the future in Jesus' headship over creation. And a power that is presently manifested in Jesus' headship over the church. Now, having explained that, you can now move on to explain how that same power has worked into the life of the believer, into the life, in the life of a believer. First, by raising them from spiritual death and then seating them in the same place, the same place where Christ is seated, is now seated. Now, as a whole, verses 1 through 10 is perhaps one of the most wonderful and shocking passages of Scripture ever written. Why? Because it's here that we discover the true diagnosis of humanity. And it's far worse than most of us would like to admit. But we're also going to discover the amazing grace and goodness of God. And it's far greater than any of us could possibly imagine. Here's the thing. We fail to grasp the severity of our sin and the reality of our situation outside of Christ. We will never grasp the wonder or the power of the gospel. And so what I hope that you'll learn today, what, you, what I hope you will get from this message is how sinners, sinners deserve nothing. They deserve nothing but God's wrath. But they can become trophies of His grace. So before we get into the first part of our reading today, uh, let's pray once more and ask Him to speak to us to us now through his word. Heavenly Father, yes, it, it is great and wonderful that you have us all here. You have given us this chilly morning here in February to just enjoy the wonderful blessings of your creation. As, as, so now as we gather here together and sit at your feet to hear what you have to say through your word, I pray that it will speak powerfully and intimately and, and 
to the hearts of every person that is sitting here, Lord. Those who are looking for answers, those who are, need reminders, those who need encouragement, those who need hope. And the same goes for those that are watching this live right now or maybe watching the recording later on, that you will also speak powerfully to each and every one of them. They may see your love, your glory, your grace. You will also, uh, they will see the power that you have to turn dead sinners into living saints. So now we ask that you move powerfully, fill this room with your spirit, keep us safe now, and as, I, as Pastor Isaac prayed, may we just, may we not even worry about the things going on outside these walls. Speak powerfully to us now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And the Word of God says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously lived according to the ways of the world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath, as the others were also. Having described a believer's spiritual uh, possessions in Christ there in chapter 1, Paul now turns to, another, to a correlate of truth, our spiritual position in Christ. He begins by first explaining what God has done for all sinners in general. But before we look in detail at this devastating description of the human condition apart from God, we need to be clear that it's a description of everybody. Paul isn't giving us a portrait of a particular tribe or a degraded segment of society or even, he's not even talking about the blatant pagans that were around during his day. No, this is a biblical diagnosis of fallen man in fallen society everywhere. Now, true, even though Paul is directly speaking to his Gentile readers in the area, you see there in verse 3 that he quickly goes, from, goes on to include himself, and his fellow Jew, and his fellow Jews. And then he concludes that verse with a reference to the rest of mankind. And so again, it's important that before moving forward that he's describing every believer's condition before they experienced God's transforming power. So whether you claim to be religious or non-religious, or whether Jew or Gentile, this is, this is a description of you and me outside of Christ. Well, here then Paul describes, begins to describe the awful condition of sinners who deserved nothing but God's wrath. He explained to the believers there, there in Ephesus that before their conversion, before they were converted, they were dead. Again, to be clear, this, of course, does not refer to physical death, but rather spiritual death. This means that they were lifeless, toward God. They had no vital contact with them. They lived as if, as if he did not exist. Now their cause of death was their trespasses 
and sins. Now, is there a difference between trespasses and sins? Yes. Sins are any form of wrongdoing, whether consciously committed or not, and thoughts, words, or deeds which fall short of God's perfection. Trespasses, on the other hand, are sins which are committed in open violation of a known law. So you see, here's the thing. The unbeliever, the unbeliever isn't sick. They're dead. They don't need resuscitation. They need resurrection. All lost sinners are dead. And the only difference between one sinner and another is the state of decay. The lost person on Skid Row may look worse, may look all beat up on the outside than the unsaved CEO working at the tall building that that beggar is, or that, that guy is begging in front of. But the reality is both are dead in sin. And one corpse cannot be more dead than the other. Do you know what this means? Do you know what this tells us? This means that our world, our world is one vast graveyard filled with people that are dead while they, while they live. Not just this world, but in our city, in your neighborhoods, in your schools, in your workplaces. They're filled with people who are, who are dead, even though they're living. Only the power of God can transform dead sinners into living saints. Well, after, state, after, state, after having stated the condition of the sinner's shared condition, Paul then gives, a more, gives more details to back up his claim. In verses 2 and 3, he described their spiritual condition in three ways. The unregenerate. When I say unregenerate, just to be clear, these are those that are, again, not born again. He first says, the unregenerate follow the ways of the world. Unbelievers follow the lifestyles of other unbelievers. They experience the world's peer pressures. This world, in the Greek cosmos, is the satanically organized system that opposes that hates and opposes all that is godly. The unsaved follow the ruler of the power of the air. This is Satan, who Paul also called the God of this age in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Revelation Chapter 12, verse 9 tells us that in the middle of the tribulation, he will cast down, he will be cast down to earth, to the earth, no longer to rule the world or have access to God's presence. But for now, the unsaved are in the clutches of this ruler and follow in his opposition to God. The additional description, the spirit now working in the disobedient, also speaks of Satan as well. Now, this doesn't mean that Satan is personally at work in the life of each unbeliever. See, since Satan is a created being, he's limited in space. Unlike Unlike God, who is omnipresent, Satan cannot be 
in all places all at once at one, or at one time. But because of his demonic associates and his power over the world system, Satan influences the lives of all unbelievers and also seeks to influence believers. He wants to make people children of disobedience. Why? Well, he himself was disobedient to God. So he wants others to disobey him too. See, one of uh, Satan's chief tools for getting people to disobey God are lies. He's a liar, church. He's a liar, my brothers and sisters in Christ. And it was his lie at the beginning of human history, that lie that he said, no, you certainly will not die. That lie, was, that, lie that he said, that's what plunged the human race into sin. So every unsaved person today in today's world system disobey God because they believe the lies of Satan. So when a person believes and practices a lie, guess what? They become a child of disobedience. However, the unconverted not only are under the pressure of the world system and Satan's control, but they also enjoy it. We too all previously lived among them is Paul's reminder to his Gentile readers that the Jews, all of us, also joined in this disobedience. He goes on to say that they were unsaved, that uh, when they were unsaved, they conducted themselves by their fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh, and thoughts. Paul understood this. He was, he was right on about it and he, he knew that he was still carried by his fleshly desires and the inclinations of his flesh. Now by the flesh, Paul doesn't mean the actual body because of itself, the body isn't sinful. God created this body, and it can be used for His glory. It can be used, again, it, it's described, it, can be descri- it has been described as a temple of the Lord. So the body itself isn't the sin, is it, isn't what is, is, is sinful. It doesn't mean the body. The flesh refor- refers to that fallen nature that we were born with that wants to control the body and the mind to make us disobey God. Furthermore, the desires of the flesh and of the mind may range all the way from legitimate appetites to various forms of immorality and perversion. Paul finishes off In verse 3, by saying, we were by nature children under wrath as they, as the others, were also. So not only were we dead because of sin, drugged by our sin, and depraved in our sin, as children of wrath, we were doomed by our sin. Why were we children of wrath? Because the wrath of God abides on those who did not receive the free gift of salvation. You see, in and of ourselves and apart from God, we're desperately and hopelessly lost. 
We're not sick. We weren't sick. We were dead. We are without life, again, apart from Christ. We are without life, without hope, without potential, without worth. Any value we may have or any hope must come from outside of us. And so it does come. It does come in Christ. This is the good news of the gospel. This is the good news of the gospel and that which Paul will explain next with the glorious exhibition of God's grace towards the unregenerate. So let's go back to our passage if you still have your Bibles open. And let's pick up in verse 4, and we'll be reading all the way to verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. He also raised us, up, raised, raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages, he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For you, and I love this verse right here, these next two verses. For you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves, from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. Amen. Amen. Those words but God, are beautiful. They're wonderful. I love those words. They're a beacon of light and hope in a sea of despair. The condition of men in sin, it isn't hopeless or terminal. Because God has come into, God has come to the rescue of fallen men through his provision in Christ Jesus. Paul begins with the motivation of God, which prompted him to provide a way of escape, which provided him to, which prompted him to provide a way of escape from our condition of sin and eternal death. See, God the creator of this universe was motivated by his mercy and his love for us. This divine motivation do very little for our self-esteem. However, it will do much to promote humility on our part and deep gratitude toward God. Our love for God is prompted by His love for us. A love which initiates our love in response. 1 John 4.19 We love because He first loved us. God's love for us is vastly different from our love for him. See, he loved us. He loved you while you were his enemy. While you were still dead in your sins and transgressions. So you see, God's love isn't a response. It isn't a response. It's a cause, church. God's mercy isn't prompted by our potential or by any qualities we think 
we have or we possess, but by our own pathetic condition. Divine grace wasn't bestowed on us because we were so worthy or because God found anything good in us, but because of the goodness which is in God himself. The goodness is in the giver, not the recipient. Let me illustrate this, or give you an illustration, show you what I mean. Suppose you were called by one of those beauty businesses which specializes, specializes in makeovers. If you were offered a free makeover, should you be flattered? Should you, should you take pride in your beauty? I don't think so. The makeover is needed because of the lack of your beauty, because of your lack of beauty. No beauty business is going to advertise its work by selecting a beautiful woman and then making only slight improvements on her beauty. They're going to take the most of a hopeless case they can find and then take credit for the transformation. If a plastic uh, surgeon called you offering free cosmetic surgery, so that, he couldn't use, so that he could use you for advertising, for a commercial, you should feel grateful, but not proud. He didn't choose you because you were so attractive. He chose you because you were so ugly and could demonstrate the marvelous skills he has as a plastic surgeon. So it is, my friends, so it is with God's grace. God sent Jesus into the world to suffer and to die in the sinner's place, in your place. He did this because we were in such terrible shape. He did this so that he could demonstrate his grace and his power in transforming a dead man or a woman into a living sacrifice, a living testimony of his grace and power. So you see, God's motivation in saving us, in saving you, it shouldn't flatter you, it shouldn't flatter us. But it does glorify him. God's grace and salvation doesn't come to us in various forms from which we can choose. His grace has been poured out lavishly in Christ, in Christ and in him alone. It's through our union with him that we are transformed from what we were, from what we were, to what he is. We learned in verses 1 and 3 that our separation from God through sin has made us what we were in. But as described here in Oh, as described in verses 19 through 23 in chapter 1, our identification with Christ through faith makes us all that Christ is. Though on account of our sin, we were dead. In Christ, what? we were made alive. Though we were formerly dead, we have been raised in him. And although we were formerly enslaved by our own passions to the world and to Satan, in Christ, we are now seated in the heavenly places and have become enslaved to him by, 
who by love delivered us from the bondage of sin and to death. We're then told in verse 7, the primary purpose of God sending His Son to die in the sinner's place wasn't, it wasn't to produce happiness, the happiness of the sinner saved by grace, but rather the demonstration of the grace of God for all of eternity. See, God's purposes aren't merely temporal. They're just not for the here and now. They're eternal. God's purpose in saving sinners isn't just to make men happy, to provide blessings, or enable people to escape the torments of hell. The fact is that God is just as glorified by the punishment of the wicked of the wicked as he is the salvation of those whom he makes righteous. Whether it be by punishment of the wicked or in the salvation of sinners by grace, God is working all things. He's working all things out for his glory, for his glory. The salvation of sinners is thus subordinate to God's ultimate purpose of bringing glory to himself. That's what it's all about, for God to be, bring glory to himself. In the case of the salvation of sinners, salvation of sinners, it is the grace of God. It is the grace of God which is on display in the case of the judgment of the wicked, it's the holiness and justice of God which is demonstrated. Now, the next three verses present a clear statement of the simple plan of salvation as we can find in the Bible. It all originates with grace with the grace of God. He takes the initiative in providing it. Salvation, you see, is given to those who are utterly, utterly unworthy of it on the basis of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is given as a present possession those who are saved can know it. Writing to the Ephesians, Paul said, you have been saved. See, he knew it. He knew they were saved, and they knew they were saved. The way we receive the gift of eternal life is through faith. Is through faith. Faith means that man takes his place as a lost, guilty sinner and receives the Lord Jesus as his only hope for salvation. True saving faith, my friends, is the commitment of a person, of a person to a person. Any idea that man can earn or deserve salvation is forever exploded. It's blown up by the words, and that, and that not of yourselves. Do you get that? Dead people, dead people can do nothing, and sinners deserve nothing but punishment. Paul then says it's God's gift. A gift, of course, is a free, unconditional present. That is, that's the only basis on which God offers salvation. 
the gift of God. Listen carefully. The gift of God is salvation by grace and through faith. It's offered to all people everywhere. Not to a select few, not just to a certain people in a particular church or organization or club. It's offered to all people everywhere. It's not of works, that is. It's not something a person can earn through supposedly, supposedly meritorious deeds. It can't be earned, for instance, by confirmation. It can't be earned by baptism. It can't be earned by church membership. It can't be earned by church attendance, by holy communion, by trying to keep the Ten Commandments, by living by the sermon of the Mount. It can't be earned by giving to charity or giving all your wealth to the church. It can't be earned by being a good neighbor. And it can't be earned by living a moral and respectable life. I can go on and on and on, but it can't be earned. People aren't saved by works. And they are not saved by faith plus works. They are saved through faith alone. Through faith alone. The minute, the moment you add works of any kind or in any amount as a means of gaining eternal life, salvation is no longer by grace. One reason that works are positively included, excluded, is to prevent human boasting. If anyone could be saved by his works, then he would have reason to boast before God. But as Romans chapter 3, verse 27 says, this is impossible. If anyone could be saved by his own or her own good works, then the death of Christ was unnecessary. As Galatians chapter 2, verse 21 says, but we know that the reason Jesus died was because there was no other way by which guilty sinners could be saved. If anyone could be saved by his, by his good works, his own good works, then he would be his own savior. And he could worship himself. But what is that? That's idolatry. And what does God think of idolatry? He hates it. He forbids it. Even if someone could be saved through faith in Christ, plus his own good works, you would have the impossible situation of two saviors, Jesus and the sinner. Christ would then have to share his glory of saviorhood with another. And this, he just won't do. He won't do that. Finally, if anyone could contribu contribute to his own salvation by works, then God would owe it to him. This too, my friends, is impossible. Romans 11.35 tells us that God cannot be indebted to anyone. In contrast to works, faith excludes boasting. Why? Because it's non-meritorious. A man has no reason to be proud that he trusted in the Lord. Faith in him is the most sane, rational, sensible thing a person can do. To trust one's creator 
and Redeemer is the only logical, is only logical in reason and, and it's reasonable. So if we cannot trust him, if you cannot trust him, then who can you trust? Finally, in verse 10, the result of salvation is that we are his workmanship. The handiwork of God, not of ourselves. A born-again believer. Listen carefully. If you are a born-again believer, you're a masterpiece of God. When we think of the raw materials he has to work with, his achievement, God's achievement, is all the more remarkable. Indeed, this masterpiece is nothing less than a new creation through union with Christ. See, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. He is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Per 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. And the object of this new creation is found in the phrase, for good works. Now, while it's true that we are not saved by good works, it is equally true that we are saved for good works. We're not saved by good works. And also, we are saved for good works. Good works are not the root, not the root, but the fruit. We don't work in order to be saved, but because we are saved. This is the aspect of truth that is emphasized in James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. When James says that faith without works is dead, he doesn't mean that we're saved by faith plus works, but by the kind of faith that results in a life of good works. See, simply put, works prove the reality. They prove the reality of our faith. Paul, he agrees we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. And so God's order is then this, faith, salvation, good works, reward. See, faith leads to salvation. Salvation results in good works. Good works will be rewarded by him. But then the question arises, what kind of good works am, am I are you expected to do? Well, Paul answers that question. Good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In other words, God has a blueprint. God has a blueprint for every life. He has a blueprint for your life, for my life. Before we were converted, before we were born again, he mapped out a spiritual career for us. Our responsibility is to find His will for us and obey it. Maybe you know what your calling is. and Maybe you've walked away, and, but just know that it's not because of anything immoral, because you disqualified yourself. He's going to bring you back to what He's called you to do. And he will empower you. He will love you. He will just give you the strength to, to go on. We don't have to work out a plan for our lives, but only accept the plan which he has drawn up for us. And so this delivers us from being scared, from being all, from the frenzy that we may feel and ensures that our lives will be of maximum glory to him, 
of most blessing to others and of greatest reward to ourselves. So in order to find out the good works he has planned out for our individual lives, here's some things I really believe we should do or you should do. Number one, confess and forsake sin as soon as you become conscious of it in your lives. Number two, continually and unconditionally yield to him. Number three, study the word of God to discern his will. And then do whatever he tells you to do. Number four, spend time in prayer each day. Number five, seize opportunities of service as they arise. Cultivate the fellowship and counsel of other, of other believers, of other Christians. See, God prepares us for good works. He prepares good works for us to perform. Then he rewards us when we perform them. Such is his grace. Now, in closing, there are two main applications here. First, make sure that you're a new creation in Christ. Have you truly been saved by his grace through faith in Christ alone? Let me ask that question again. Have you truly been saved by his grace through faith in Christ alone? Spurgeon pointed out that the only way you can become a Christian is by being created. Now, he anticipated the objection, but we cannot create ourselves. He answers, it is even so. Stand back and quit all pretense of being creators. And the further you retreat from self-conceit, the better. For it is God who must create you. How I wish, how I wish that you felt this. And then he anticipates the reply. It would drive us into despair. He answers, it might drive you to such despair as it as would be the means of your flying to Christ, Christ. And that's precisely what I desire. It would be greatly to your gain if you would never again indulge in a shred of hope in your own works and were forced to accept the grace of God. My friends, the point is this. You cannot work for God. You cannot work for God until God has first done his work of saving, of his saving grace in you. You cannot work for God until God has first done his work of saving grace in you. Second, if you have been saved, the focus of your life should be, Lord, what will you have me do? Paul asked God that question immediately after his experience on the Damascus road. In Acts 22.10, the Lord answered, Get up and go to Damascus, and there you will be told of all that has been appointed to you, or appointed you to do. See, God has already prepared beforehand. God already prepared beforehand Paul's future ministry. Paul had to learn God's plan and walk in it. And so, my brothers and sisters, in Christ, so do you. So do you. The Lord tells you, sit and wait. Sit and wait. If he tells you to do this or do that, just do it. Even though it seems like it just doesn't make sense. It will over time. It's going to make sense. It's going to become clear. 
God has a wonderful plan for you, brothers and sisters in Christ. Walk in it. So now as I closed, as I close now, I, I want to give those that are watching, those that are here, anybody that may be listening to this message, an opportunity to be saved, to be born again. Okay, let me remind you what it says there in, in verse 1 of chapter 2, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously, in which you live according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. Does that describe you? You may not know it, but again, you're far from God if you're not born again, if you're not a Christian, if you're not a believer, if you don't have the Holy Spirit living in you. But God provided an answer. God provided a way to make you holy and righteous. And that's through the blood of Jesus Christ. By believing in him, by surrendering your life to him. And be becoming, by becoming born again. So, if you're ready, if you truly are now ready to to let go of that former life, to be that new creation that God intended for you to be. I want to invite you to the cross where you can ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. Now, if you've never prayed before, it's okay. I, I will lead you in a prayer to do that. And so wherever you're at, with all your heart, with all sincerity, Close your eyes. Pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. And I'll turn from my sins and confess you and you alone as my personal Lord and Savior. Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me, and thank you for saving me. So now I ask you to fill me. Fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you sincerely pray that and don't know where to do, what to do next, we can help you. Just reach out to us. You know, we can help you find a church wherever you may be, and, um, and uh, we can just talk to you and pray with you if that's what is also you need. So uh, let us know how you heard this message, you know, how you came to know the Lord, and, you know, it would be a great story to, to hear uh, and share. I want to thank you for those watching, listening, for uh, being with us, for checking this video out, and I hope that you can see again God can turn dead sinners into living saints. Hope you have a great week. Be a blessing to others. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvcc elp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.